this is just pure and simple history and examination a final year mbbs or an intern or a first year orthopedic pg stuff but you might find that most even practicing clinicians sometimes miss on these points unless they are regularly revised and internalized so whenever we see a patient of neck pain one must uh, it, it's a very common saying if you hear hoof beats think of horses before zebras so the commonest cause of neck pain is what is a mechanical neck pain the other more co most common cause of neck pain is what is called cervical radiculopathy and then there are serious red flag causes of neck neck pain in which comes cervical myelopathy spinal cord tumor and other things and i'll take you through all of them very quickly now uh, it is important to remember the anatomy of the vertebra and to realize that there are regional differences between the neck and the lumbar spine now while in a lumbar spine you really won't expect uh, uh, the disc prolapse to compress upon the spinal cord and to ever result in a myelopathy and in the lumbar region you only have the disc and maybe the facet joints and the uh, ligamentum flavum as the sources of compression here you have one other thing the zygapophyseal joints or the uncovertebral joints and it is very rare for a cervical disc to be actually the source of radicular pain or uh, the source of myelopathy the more common sources are actually the zygapophyseal joint hypertrophy and uh, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis which result in atlantoaxial instability the other thing to note is that the cervical spine is the region where the spinal cord is the narrowest so therefore even a small disc that you see on an mri can be responsible for a lot of pressure and lot of symptoms for the patient and as our population is getting more and more active people are into martial arts and all kind of sports you will get to see a lot of these pathologies even in the young and the athletic population now one of the cardinal signs of cervical radiculopathy so if you have a patient who comes and tells you that i have pain in the neck and it radiates to my arm uh, before even thinking of radiculopathy and the dermatomal pattern of radiation this very simple leading question ki does keeping your hand on top of the head result in some relief and your patient will tell you that most of the times i sleep in this position because this is the only position that i get the relief in and the simple reason is that shoulder hyperadduction and a head tilt to the opposite side slightly increases the diameter of the foramen through which the nerve root exits and gives the patient considerable amount of relief to the extent that most people may actually spend the entire night in this position because the moment they bring their arm down it causes them pain now this is what is called a spurling test one of the best tests to diagnose cervical radiculopathy so again if you have a patient complaining of neck pain with radiation to arm you have a differential of brachial neuritis diabetic neuropathy and uh, cervical radiculopathy you just do the spurling test you rotate the neck slightly to the affected side tilt the neck to the affected side and then compress the neck now how much do you compress the neck uh, if you look at published literature it tells you to apply a 7 kg amount of force so you really can't quantify what is 7 kg but just remember be gentle especially if your patient is a senior patient you please be gentle with your patient any maneuver which increases the pressure in the abdomen or any maneuver which like valsalva which increases the csf pressure is likely to aggravate the pain hyperextension of the neck is likely to aggravate the pain and always remember that in addition to the typical radiation along the arm you may have a typical radiation the pain may actually go to the jaw it may go to the front of the chest obviously it travels down the arm so these are alternate areas of pain radiation which you must be aware of now if you look at the arrangement of nerve fibers you will notice that in any mixed nerve the motor fibers are towards the center of the nerve and it's the sensory fibers which are distributed to the periphery so therefore initially whenever a nerve is pressed your patient is likely to get sensory symptoms but if your patient complains of motor symptoms or if you are able to elicit weakness it means that the pressure is already too much so to so to the extent that the central motor nerves are also affected so this is a red flag sign to watch out for so coming to the dermatomal pattern of uh, symptoms 
if you recall the anatomy of the spinal cord you will realize that there is a cervical enlargement there is a lumbodorsal enlargement as well and therefore uh, the cervical enlargement has uh, uh, eight cervical nerve roots exiting out of it each one of them corresponds to the foramen except of course c1 the all others like c2 comes out of c1 c2 c3 comes out of c2 c3 so on and so forth now this is something which you must strive to remember and it is not that difficult uh, the level C5 is motor to the deltoid, it is reflex for the biceps brachii and it is sensory to the shoulder. The level C6 again is motor to the biceps, the reflex is a brachioradialis reflex and it's sensory to the thumb. C7 is for triceps, elbow extension as, as a motor, manual mo muscle testing, the triceps reflex and the index, the benediction attitude. So remember the two benediction fingers, the induction and the index and the middle fingers. C8 is the interossei. Interossei, if you uh, remember, they cause uh, pad and dab. If you remember that mnemonic, so they are responsible for finger abduction. And uh, they don't have any dedicated reflex with them. But then there is, if you read the, uh, the published spine literature, you'll find that there is something called a hand withdrawal reflex, which is associated with C8. But then it is sensory to the little finger. So these, if you manage to remember, you are able to easily screen the levels. And the most common affected levels are the C5, C6, and the C6, C7 levels.